Hey what's up guys? Today, I'll show you a horror comedy film, Creep Show, Part 3. Spoiler ahead, watch out and take care. The movie begins in a neighborhood where a mysterious man abducts a dog to turn its meat into hot dogs. He later builds a stand and starts selling hot dogs throughout the neighborhood. The film then proceeds to the first tale titled Alice. Alice is a haughty student who hates everyone in her neighborhood, especially the weird professor across their house. On her way home, she ignores Professor, who's searching for his missing rabbit in the block. When she gets home, her family hangs out in the living room. Her father, Detective Jacobs, studies a universal remote that he bought earlier from a street vendor. He buys it because first, it's supposed to control everything, and second, he thinks it's one of Professor's smart inventions. Meanwhile, her mom asks her to wash up for dinner, but her brother reveals she's not going to eat because she's on a diet. Alice shouts at him for snooping on her telephone calls. When her father scolds the brother for eavesdropping, he instantly defends himself. However, the situation worsens when their grandma criticizes Alice is skinny already for a diet. Fortunately, a telephone rings in the lobby, but the call ends midway when Jacobs presses the color and hue settings in the UR. At first, everyone disappears except Alice, but when she looks back at her home, her family becomes an African-American household. They converse on the same topic like earlier, but amid conversations, the now black Jacobs presses the subtitles. Alice is back outside, although her hand has become disgustingly deformed. She then comes home to see her family are Hispanics this time. Even though she explains that UR changes their ethnicity, they don't understand her. Just then, the Latino Jacobs pushes another button, transporting Alice outside again. Alice now looks worse due to the sore blisters and deformed foot. The UR is causing her body mutation, and she's confident that Professor can help her. Across the street, Professor still searches for his rabbit, and Alice limps towards him, but she falls after a ball strikes her head. Unfortunately, the moment she recovers, Professor is gone. She then visits him at his house, but he's not there either. Nevertheless, she still enters the house to call for help from the police, but the operator can't hear her chicken voice at all. Since there's nothing to do, she snoops around, discovering Professor is getting married and consuming the wine and cake all at once. Suddenly, the mailman enters the house to deliver a pet cage package to Professor. Alice then asks him to stay put, before going to the kitchen to spit out the cake she's eating. But when she returns, the only thing left behind is the package. Alice cries in a chicken voice due to her helpless situation, but then, the back door opens, revealing a bright room. When Alice walks into the back door, she's transported back to her house with her normal face again. She's happy to be reunited with her family, but her father pushes another button, causing Alice to transform into a monster. Her skinless body exposes her flesh, making her unrecognizable to everyone. She then makes an exit outside to escape, but her feeble limbs cause her to stumble on the ground. Finally, Professor approaches her, introducing his universal remote gadget. Alice begs him to return her back to her skinny normal self, and Professor accepts to do so. Meanwhile, the family goes outside to dispatch the monster, but their ill intent disappears upon seeing a cute white rabbit, which is Alice in Professor's arms. However, the moment they see the rabbit, their memories with human Alice now cease to exist. The film progresses next to the second tale, titled The Radio. Jerry is a security guard on his way back to his shabby apartment after covering the day shift. The crib is run by Mr. Pimp, so street walkers are common throughout the building. While Jerry grabs his mail in the mailbox, Mr. Pimp corners him to market as hustlers for companionship, but his attention averts to the blonde call girl exiting the building. He chases after her blonde body outside, because she's not one of his hustlers, but she's working in his crib. Jerry bolts upstairs to his apartment, but a sexy call girl named Eva unexpectedly calls him before he enters. Jerry only stares at her as she descends the stairs to meet her boss, Mr. Pimp, in the lobby. He enters his apartment, drinking while listening to a sports match on his radio. However, his radio malfunctions midway, and despite his efforts to fix it, it's still busted. At night, Jerry buys a $5 radio from the street vendor. As expected for being cheap, the radio winds up broken too, right after he tests it out. He nearly throws it away, but the radio orders him not to. Jerry thinks it's just hallucination, but the radio talks again to ascertain she's real. Jerry initially distrusts the radio, but over time, the radio takes over his life. He even brings the radio to his work the next day, and the radio instructs him to invest money in technology stocks, because it's necessary to diversify to gain more money. Right after his shift, he goes straight home, encountering Eva and Mr. Pimp as usual in the lobby. The radio seems to like Eva, but hates Mr. Pimp. Afterward, Jerry climbs upstairs, but only to witness his neighbor couple are fighting. Therefore, he shouts at them to quell their deafening quarrel. 
At night, the radio guides Jerry to steal $3,000 in a shoebox that's located at the top floor of the adjacent building. The money is his one-way ticket to success, but on his way back to his apartment, the neighbor couple spot him with a shoebox. The radio orders Jerry to kill the neighbor husband soon, otherwise the neighbor will kill him first for the money. Jerry hesitates to obey, but after the neighbor husband tries to break into his apartment using a knife, Jerry deals with him fast. Since a gun creates noise, he settles by pushing the neighbor off the floor, causing him to fall downstairs and die from a heavy concussion. Jerry then picks up the knife with a cloth to leave no fingerprints, but the neighbor wife unexpectedly catches him covering up his crime. Regrettably, he's forced to kill her also to eliminate any witnesses. The next day, Detective Jacobs interviews Jerry about the neighbor couple's death. Based on the preliminary investigation, the couple frequently fought over drug issues, which led the husband to commit suicide after murdering his wife with a knife. However, Jacobs thinks the whole setup is quite odd. Jerry then testifies that he witnessed their intense fights to reinforce the idea that the couple possibly committed murder to end their problems. Jacobs at that point concludes the interview and then asks Jerry to give him a call if anything useful arises. Jerry thinks he's off the hook, but Jacobs unexpectedly returns for one more question. He wants to know if Jerry has any idea what's bothering Mr. Pimp because he seemed agitated when he interviewed him earlier. Unfortunately, Jerry is clueless. Now that he's free, he secures his possessions in boxes because he's about to move out. Just then, Eva asks if she can join because she wants to escape from Mr. Pimp, who accuses her of stealing his money from the top floor building. Jerry quickly realizes the radio ordered him to steal Mr. Pimp's money. Moreover, he decides to bring Eva along the trip despite the radio's opposition, who wants to kill her because it believes she's going to kill him right after she discovers the money. Just then, Jerry pulls over near a remote building to let Eva take a smelly break in the toilet. While she is busy with her smelly business, he destroys the radio to keep his friend alive. However, the radio is right because while he removes himself from the radio's influence, Eva shoots him dead. It turns out Eva knows about the money, but when she's about to leave, Mr. Pimp fires a pimp bullet straight into her head, ending her calling life. Mr. Pimp then grabs his money from Jerry's car and places it in his trunk. Afterward, he takes a seat, talking to the radio that he bought from the street vendor. Mr. Pimp shortly departs from the crime scene and embarks on a journey to Canada under the guidance of the radio's scheme to success. The third tale, titled The Call Girl, begins with Rachel, who is a serial killer in the guise of a call girl. She enters an alley road, ignoring the angry Mr. Pimp, who's chasing after her for working in his crib unpermitted. She has no time to deal with him because she's on her way to meet her new victim, Victor, in a familiar neighborhood. But a homeless lady suddenly approaches her, condemning her as a sinner. Since Rachel fears no jail, she cruelly kills the annoying homeless lady just to shut her up, giving her a free home in hell. At night, Rachel finally meets Victor at his house. However, Rachel notices Victor is absent from all family portraits around the house. Victor answers that his parents prefer his perfect brother to him, who's considered the black sheep of the family. Victor invites Rachel to his bedroom afterward, where he settles the payment first before the session starts. During the session, Rachel straddles Victor while he's blindfolded and cuffed to the bed. Victor expects to get laid, but Rachel stabs him multiple times instead until he's dead. Rachel then takes a shower to rinse the bloodstains, but after leaving the shower, she hears a disembodied voice calling her name. She then checks Victor to see if he's dead as shit, but he's not because he's an immortal vampire. The next day, Victor leaves the neighborhood like nothing happened, while Rachel hangs dead and bloody in the dining room among the original residents of the house, supposedly murdered by Victor. The fourth tale, titled The Professor's Wife, begins with the same weird professor shown earlier, who is a mad scientist at a university. He receives a visit from the dean, who wants to formally discuss his wedding invitation. The dean questions if the upcoming wedding is real and not one of his usual pranks. Professor then flashes his engagement ring, only to attest the occasion is really happening. The dean congratulates him on his new chapter of life. At night, Professor also receives a visit from his former special students. As expected, they catch up about each other's lives, especially an update on Professor's special project in years. Professor then eagerly shares that his project is almost done, but he doesn't elaborate on the details because they're set for his wedding. Since the two friends are eager to meet Professor's fiancé, he finally introduces Kathy, a curvy young woman who's smart, sweet, and a great cook. They can't help but feel surprised to learn their old professor is marrying someone half his age. However, Professor needs to buy something in the store, leaving his students behind with Kathy. The two friends begin to speculate if the project Professor mentioned earlier is pertaining to Kathy. They think Kathy is a robot, and to confirm their theory, they observe her during their interactions with her. 
Throughout the interactions, they notice Kathy experiences buffering, repeating words, is prohibited from drinking and eating, and strangely doesn't remember her first encounter with Professor. The two friends deduce that their observations resemble a robot's characteristics. Moreover, they assume Professor left them alone with Kathy because he wants to test them to see if they can figure out Kathy's true identity. Soon, the two friends agree to dismantle and dissect Kathy. While they take her apart, they applaud Professor for creating a robot with realistic body parts like blood, skin, innards, and brain. However, they discover from a scrapbook that Kathy is a real human who earned a science college degree due to being a genius. Professor is not lying to them when he said he's about to get married because Kathy is a mail-order bride he found across the globe. The two friends fall into sheer panic upon hearing Professor has arrived from the store with a cake. While Professor calls for them, the two friends hide Kathy's body parts throughout the kitchen before cleaning the bloodstains. Afterward, they hide in the back door right before the oven blares an alarm. Professor goes to the kitchen to check the oven, but he screams in a chicken voice upon discovering Kathy's brainless severed head placed inside. The last tale, titled Haunted Dog, begins with a physician named Farwell, who's sentenced by the court to serve 30 days in the clinic. Unfortunately, he's horrible and unworthy of his job because he's apathetic and rude and neglects his patient's welfare. For instance, he shamelessly cuts in line to buy a hot dog, but the hot dog he just got drops on the ground, making the food dirty enough to be even edible. Nonetheless, he still gives the dirty hot dog to the vagrant, who's begging for food. Once more, he cuts in line to buy a hot dog and then eats it while he's on his way to the clinic. Meanwhile, the vagrant dies from the dirty hot dog he gave, which he intentionally ignores. In the clinic, Farwell meets all his patients for the day with the help of his nurse. However, he treats them poorly, throwing them useless prescriptions, instead of examining them properly. For example, he blatantly informs the elderly lady who's struggling with poor eyesight that she's going blind and there's no cure for her anymore because she's too old for medication and surgical operation. Moreover, he intakes numerous ecstasy pills in between breaks like it's a mere candy. After his shift, he runs to his car to get away fast, but suddenly, the vagrant's ghost appears before him. Farwell brushes off the fact that the ghost is haunting him for his crime, so he finds a way to distract himself. At night, he visits the crib to attend a house party. Meanwhile, the street vendor recognizes him, asking if he can examine him shortly, but Farwell only ignores him. Just then, the professor shown in the previous story meets the street vendor to buy an advanced voodoo's kit because he wants to resurrect Kathy. Moreover, the street vendor is simply thankful to Professor because he made sales out of Professor's talking radios. Meanwhile, Farwell first pays Victor, the vampire shown in the previous story, with a bag of ecstasy pills to access his house party. When he's finally inside, Victor picks up Rachel's business card on the floor that fell out of Farwell's pocket. During the party, Farwell mingles with everyone, but his wild night turns into a nightmare when the ghost haunts him again. He tries to hide in the bathroom, where he consumes another pill, but the ghost still follows him. He can't have fun when fear creeps behind him, so he's forced to leave the party. And now that Farwell's gone, everyone unmasks their human faces to commence the party of the vampires. The next day, Farwell goes to work, wasted due to last night's booze. Once again, he meets more patients, but completely disregards their actual health problems as usual. Just then, a father and his daughter enter the clinic for a follow-up checkup. After he reads the daughter's medical files, he nonchalantly informs them that she's dying due to a brain tumor. Just then, Farwell freezes in his seat upon seeing the ghost standing outside his window. Right after the ghost disappears, he rushes out of the clinic, ignoring his angry nurse and devastated father and daughter in his office. At night, he tries to party hard to forget about the ghost, but when he gets home, he asks the security guard nearby to watch over him for tonight. However, the security guard only dashes off, disregarding Farwell's request for safety. When the ghost resurfaces before him to flex its ghostly figure, Farwell stabs it with a knife. Due to fear, he's unable to process that he can't hurt the dead. The ghost even manages to pull out a hot dog from his wound, causing Farwell to freak out even more. He then runs to his car, where he intends to seek refuge in the crib. The next day, he arrives in the crib, but the ghost is still on his tail, like a GPS gadget. Farwell can't endure it anymore, resulting in a heart attack due to excessive intake of happy pills and the haunting of the vagrant's ghost. Soon, the ambulance arrives to deliver his body to the hospital. The movie concludes with a prologue of Professor getting married to a resurrected Kathy, who was dismembered earlier by the students. The two newlyweds depart from the church, and sitting in the backseat is Alice. Meanwhile, the priest overhears Alice's mom is still blabbering about her imaginary daughter, so he approaches Alice's family. He advises them to recite a long, meaningful prayer for the mom's mental betterment. 
Moreover, near the church is the hot dog vendor, who finally unveils that he's the creep all along. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.